Your Phase 2 report covers COVID mitigation measures in airports. Can you give us a quick overview of the findings? Yes, I can. The, the second report on, we call it curb to curb, actually had many aspects to it. One was a deep inquiry into the practices that airports were currently doing in response to the COVID challenge. And then beyond that, we did a deeper inquiry into the capacity of airports to have their ventilation systems respond uh, to what will inevitably be some crowding conditions that will occur in airports. So in both those instances, we found that one, airports were being very aggressive, uh, using a lot of foresight, being proactive uh, with disinfection plans, with uh, uh, efforts to keep people distanced from each other, uh, make sure that they were masked, putting up plastic petitions where there was face-to-face -face encounters. Uh, some were being very innovative and looking at new technologies and testing them out uh, that would help prevent uh, transmission. And uh, so they were the primary things on the airport operation side. But we, but we recognize airports are very different in terms of their architecture than almost any place that we commonly are in. Uh, and to some degree, that's an advantage. They're big volumes, spaces. They're connected spaces, lots of airflow, lots of chances for mixing and dilution. But nevertheless, there are places where people do congest. And it's in those particular places that we uh, demonstrated that airports had options available to them but they needed to be uh, very uh, deliberate in understanding their capacities of their ventilation systems and their performance of those systems to reduce airborne transmission. In your first report, you describe aircraft ventilation systems as more than 99% effective in diverting aerosol particles, including coronavirus, from passengers' breathing zones. You're not so definitive about airports, suggesting review by HVAC professionals, for example. Given there are so many airports, how do passengers know that the ventilation is working to optimal standards? Well, thinking about aircraft, you know, it a, serves a simple function to deliver passengers from point to point. And the engineering design of their environmental control systems are very similar. Good HEPA filtration, large volume airflows, good mixing. In fact, you can hear the air coming through gaspers, so you know that air is being mixed and diluted uh, on an airplane. But you're right to point out that in airports, we don't know. We don't even know where the air is coming from in most cases, unless you really look to where the air diffusers are. Uh, and you wouldn't know uh, whether there's adequate mixing at all. But fortunately, uh, these are big capacity systems, HVACs, mechanical ventilation air handling units, big systems moving large volumes of air, primarily to deliver thermal comfort to people that work there, that use the place. But now these same systems have to provide sufficient dilution to reduce the airborne transmission. So this is where we're saying airport facility managers should look again uh, at their systems. The filtrations, are they in place? Are they uh, working properly? Are the, is the air being distributed properly in areas where people tend to uh, congregate, gate areas, security areas, uh, luggage carousels, and the like? You suggest using air purifiers for enclosed spaces. Do you have any specific guidelines as to the types and standards of air purifiers and how effective they might be? So air, air purifiers, or many of us know them as room air cleaners, uh, can be very effective of delivering additional clean air because many of these air purifiers, and people should look to make sure the ratings uh, are indicating that, use HEPA-like filters or very efficient uh, filters. So the air that comes through them is cleaned and can be considered virus-free. So, of course, many of these units are small sizes. They're used for domestic purposes. 
a bedroom, a den, you know, to clean up the air, you can achieve additional effective air changes through those devices. Now you've got to scale them to the volume of the space that you're trying to treat. So obviously, it would be impossible to do it in a big lobby, you know, like a departure lounge, right? But they might be very effective in break rooms, for example, or small volume spaces where people might tend to take off their masks, eat, socialize. This is where they could be a very important supplemental uh, ventilation uh, system to deliver clean air. In fact, we recommended these for schools. If you want to reopen your school and you can't totally rely on air coming through the mechanical system or opening windows, if the wind isn't blowing, then these supplemental air cleaners can be very useful to bring that air change up in a given small space. Several studies from last fall, including your own, suggested that the risk of getting COVID on an airplane is almost non-existent. Given the significant surge in disease spread coupled with new, more infectious variants, can you say the same today about airplanes and what about airports? So I think there's a caveat about uh, the risk of transmission anywhere, and including a place like an aircraft cabin where you have a lot of people in a confined space. Uh, there's always a risk, uh, if, in, but the risk is really mitigated through the layered approaches of wearing good fitting mask, complying with that mask wearing, uh, and making sure people are not, uh, are, are not up and moving around the cabin, taking their mask off, talking, eating. Those circumstances uh, increase the risk. I think it stands to reason. Uh, so we're seeing new guidelines, uh, new studies uh, coming out of CDC and not of other laboratories saying that tight-fitted, well-fitted masks can provide 90% plus mitigation, coupled with dilution, coupled with distancing where you can have uh, proper uh, social distancing. Uh, you have those multiple layers and then, then include disinfection for possible contact transmission. You have multiple layers that re, that's, every one of them reduce the risk even more. So once again, nothing in life we should consider absolutely risk-free because you can't guarantee all those things are actually working at the same time. But to the extent that they are and do and people comply, and systems are performing, uh, that air travel is, represents a very low risk. If a pandemic is inherently due to moving the virus around the world, mostly by aircraft, how can the aviation industry best prepare to reduce the risk and spread of a future pandemic? So pandemics do spread uh, around the world uh, from place to place, city to city, house to house, house to office because the virus, we're the host of that virus. Uh, and as the infection uh, propagates uh, in our bodies, we have the chance of shedding it. So if we travel, we take it with us and the chance of spreading it. I think that's well understood. So what can transportation uh, do uh, to lower that risk? short of stopping all flights. And that has been the practice, you know, no flights from a certain country, if that looked to be an origin for um, a virus. So you have to enhance your screening. The trouble with this particular virus is that we can be asymptomatic. We can be shedding viruses and we don't feel sick. So we, so just reporting our symptoms being symptom-free isn't a guarantee. It'll screen out some that are feeling sick, and that's good. Keep them off uh, the flights. Uh, but you need to enhance screening uh, to really be sure. This is where the layer effects of masking, of good ventilation throughout the flight, that means on the ground as well as in, in, the, in the air, are those countermeasures for that transmission. But to really be effective, we have to do a better job at detecting the virus. And it turns out for some states like Hawaii, in fact, is requiring people that come to Hawaii to be tested COVID-free 
to sh certify that within 72 hours of arrival. And uh, this then allows them not to go through quarantine uh, and be sequestered for 14 days or so, and they can uh, be a tourist. And those kind of screening uh, we see in certain sit situations uh, is effective in uh, lowering the probability of uh, transmission from place to place. The airline industry would be wise to learn from this experience uh, during this pandemic crisis to really understand what effective measures are being taken now that could still be in place uh, in the future. I mean, we're going to have seasonal flu with us all the time as new variants of not just COVID, but of, uh, of rhinovirus, influenza that propagate through our populations. Uh, and so it was recommended in our report, recommended by ICAO, recommended by National Academy of Sciences uh, studies on cabin air quality, that ground ventilation systems perform as well as the in-flight systems uh, so that there's good ventilation during those times that people are in close contact getting on planes and getting off planes. And that might be a strategy to continue into the future. Whether you require the ground carts from air, airports to be hooked up and turned on immediately, that would be one measure, or the onboard auxiliary power unit used to keep the ventilation system going during these times. But that seems like a very good practice that would be preventive uh, for even uh, for transmission of other respiratory airborne uh, pathogens. I don't think we need to be as diligent with disinfection uh, as we are now during this pandemic. The role of fomites is not the dominant role uh, and people have personal responsibilities. It's personal hygiene and you could wipe your own surfaces that you're in close contact with. And people had been doing that in the past and maybe they wanna to continue to do that. So there are some good measures uh, that, can, that can be taken out of this crisis time that say, give us more resilience uh, going forward. In your report, you advised against the use of plastic barriers in certain situations. Can you explain why that is? Where is their use advisable and where not and why? This was interesting. In our conversations with airport management, we learned uh, during the course of this research that some of them were considering or already had installed plastic barriers that separate queuing lines, lines in security, lines in check-in. Now that's not the same thing as physical barriers in front of the counter, for example, or in front of your TSA security person that might stop large droplets should you have to take off your mask to communicate. That's extra protection for the worker and uh, it, it most and that's probably the primary reason. But plastic barriers to separate lines, we examined that issue because you think of these spaces that we occupy and the advantage of a ventilation system is to mix air thoroughly within that space. And you keep supplying fresh air into that area or cleaned air and you're diluting whatever is produced in that area. Now consider putting barriers up that disrupt that airflow. You lower the velocities, you cause uh, internal closed circulation patterns. And we said, and we demonstrated this through uh, collaboration with the University of Maryland, uh, Professor Seabrook did this detailed computational fluid dynamic modeling that traces parcels of air in those, in those rooms with barriers and without barriers. And we demonstrated through this is that those barriers could so reduce the dilution that a plume of simulated contaminants would stay longer 
in that space, would expose more in that line as they walked uh, behind a passenger that might have been infectious in front of them, shedding viruses. So we didn't say it was, you shouldn't do it. We said you need to understand the architecture, the airflow, the conditions of where you were applying this. It may, it may be okay in certain areas, but you also could have a downside risk unintended to make matters worse. That's why we said it was a point of caution that uh, airports had to understand their systems better. The airport is a vast environment. So where would you say are the highest risk areas in an airport? So uh, interesting, modern airports are fascinating. Uh, we've, you've seen anyone who's traveled in 10, 20 years has seen the evolution of airports, uh, many of them turning into shopping malls and restaurant destinations almost, uh, as we're asked to be there for two hours or so before flights or have long layovers between connecting flights. So airports are have a diverse set of sub-functions. But as a passenger, I think we can understand where what are those conditions where in non-COVID times, we felt very comfortable crowding in with other people. It might be on that tram that takes us from one terminal to another terminal. It might be on that bus that takes us from, from the gate out to the parked airplane out on the tarmac, tarmac. So, or clustering around the counter so we can hear the announcements so we know when we should board. And we all have done this. We're within a couple of feet of each other. Uh, and But now that's not okay. It's not a good thing to do. So those places of congestion around gate holds before departures or if there's a delay and people cluster, around people who are eating, we've recognized that some airports have had to close their restaurant establishments because of local requirements. Now people are eating all over the airport, taking off their masks. So that becomes a localized hotspot, let's just put it in there. So we're looking at baggage handling, we're looking at customs uh, and, and uh, border patrol, uh, we're looking at TSA screening areas, we're looking at gate holds. But we also took into consideration um, employees, the flight crews. They go to their break rooms, they go to their crew rooms, uh, TSA, security people, go to their break rooms and, you know, every few hours they can't be on their feet for long durations and they have to take lunch breaks and other breaks. So though those areas, uh, as we've seen in other settings, hospitals and schools and elsewhere, have become uh, places where transmission can occur because people relax their, uh, their compliance uh, and they uh, with uh, uh, and the ventilation might not be as adequate in those small spaces. When do you think it would be okay to return to flying? So that's a personal question. I think um, I've asked myself actually about when I want to travel again. Um, you know, I, I joked recently that I had my COVID shot and the only side effect I had was a, I had a, a severe case of wanderlust. I want to get out and travel. Uh, I think we all do. Um, so, you know, even though we think the risk is very low, I am willing to travel now. I was willing to travel beforehand. But then I got to consider other people. Right. If uh, I'm living with someone with higher risk factors than, than I personally feel I have. Um, so you've got to take those consider can, things into consideration. Uh, so on one hand, uh, I, I can feel very comfortable with traveling now. But we know that a lot, a lot of people don't. Uh, and we're getting advisories from CDC saying, you know, do not do unnecessary travel. Even Harvard University restricts our business travel. Uh, I, we made one trip uh, while we were doing this project, and I had to go through multiple layers of requests and forms and, and testing 
before my university gave me permission uh, to take a short domestic trip uh, in conjunction with studying an airport and the operations of the airport. So, so I, th I think it's, I think things will get a lot better as the, ac the uptake of vaccine uh, occurs. Uh, I think things are a lot better with the federal requirement for wearing masks uh, everywhere. So no excuse for someone to not do it on a plane or in an airport, or there are penalties if they do. So all of these things, uh, you know, build in some assurances uh, that uh, that we're getting to a better and better uh, conditions that uh, air travel will increase.